Welcome to the Laverne Church of the Brethren's weekly audio message. Here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren, we create a Christian community called by Christ to be inclusive, caring, and peace-minded. We affirm that people of any race, ethnic identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, age, economic status, faith tradition, or life situation are welcome in our congregation. We believe in compassionate service, stewardship of creation, respect for diversity, and nonviolent reconciliation for differences among all people, nations, and faith traditions. We claim no creed but the New Testament as exemplified by the life of Christ. We strive to follow the way of Jesus. And through these efforts, we seek to grow ever closer to the mind and heart of God. And now let us ground ourselves as we enter into today's message. The scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. I'm reading from the message. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil and hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scripture tells us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. a joke about an old brethren deacon who was praying one day. He says, Lord, we know that you want brethren preachers to be poor and humble, so you keep them humble and we'll keep them poor. (laughs) So maybe it's not a good idea to be too proud, but I am proud of a few things that I've accomplished, and one of them is the six years that I spent as the chairperson for the Center for Peace and Nonviolence in South Bend, Indiana. It was a group of churches, originally Brethren, Mennonite, and Quakers, but quickly expanded to include congregations of more than a dozen denominations who worked together on issues of justice like racism, immigration, housing, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, and Kingian nonviolence in the school system but none more important than the work we did in gun violence in the community. In May of 1993, gun shootings were at an all-time high in Indiana. In some cities, there was a murder every week. The effect of these senseless killings and loss of life made many faith leaders feel powerless and angry, frustrated, because we didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to stop the violence. What could we do to bring healing and peace? Eventually, through a series of meetings, we decided to go to the locations where people had been murdered within a 50-mile radius of the center of the city, which happened to be the home of Mayor Pete Buttigieg, just 
throw that in there. We gather there to sing and pray and, and, uh, and to um, pray over those places and pour water over them and, uh, and, and uh, gather to symbolize God's spirit present in that place, cleansing the land. We prayed for the ones who had been killed and the families of the shooters. We prayed for the healing of the community and the city. We started with five or six uh, faith leaders gathering after a shooting, and in the next few months we had between 40 and 50, sometimes 80 or 100 people from different faith backgrounds gathering for the prayer of healing service. It was powerful. One Saturday morning, after two teenagers had gotten into a fight, and one shot and killed the other. This group went into the street of that neighborhood. There were still blood stains on the sidewalk. We invited the mother who, uh, of the boy who had been killed to join us uh, for prayer and healing. Four houses down the street, the mother of the shooter came out onto her porch as she saw the gathering. These two women knew each other, having lived on the same street for years. A minister went to the woman on the porch and told her what we were doing and invited her to join us. At first she was hesitant, but he could tell her heart was heavy and her eyes were swollen from crying. I'm a minister, he said. Come join us. We are gathering to pray for healing for all of those involved in this tragedy. He extended his hand and she let him guide her down the steps of the porch. When they arrived at the circle of the people, the mother of the victim was four people to her right. They looked at each other while the circle sang, Let it be, John Lennon as one of the faith leaders poured water over the bloodstains on the pavement, you could hear both of the mothers uh, starting to cry. Everyone joined hands and people began to share their prayers aloud, asking for God's healing and forgiveness and peace. We concluded by singing, let there be peace on earth, after which a faith leader invited people to give a hug or a handshake to another and to share the peace of God. Both women went toward each other immediately and hugged and cried together. Their expressions of forgiveness and healing had a profound effect on everyone who was there. What I want to say this morning is that when we experience empowerment, realizing that we don't have to feel powerless. We can choose to do something that can have a positive effect. It can begin with prayer, which can give us clarity and might call us to take steps of action. We can bring the light and love of God into the darkness, and things can begin to change. Over the next few months, the murder rate in South Bend went from one killing a week to less than one a month and continued to drop over the next year. These gatherings of people for prayer, for healing, and forgiveness had such a profound effect that they created ripples in the community. Eventually, they led to other things. There was a series of gun buybacks where we collected hundreds of handguns and some assault weapons. It led to a protest and subsequent shutdown of an annual gun fair at the 4-H County Fairgrounds that had been happening for 30 years. And a round of fruitful conversations between the Center for Peace and Nonviolence and five street gangs in the city. Gun violence is a contemporary global human rights issue 
gun-related violence threatens our most fundamental human right, the right to life. This is not simply a political issue. It is that, and if you think for that reason preachers shouldn't be talking about it, well, they should, because it is one of the most important spiritual and moral issues of our time. Gun violence is a daily tragedy affecting the lives of individuals around the world. More than 500 people die every day because of violence committed by firearms. Sometimes accidental, many times not. My pastoral career of uh, 40 years of full-time ministry in the Midwest was bookended by gun violence. The first week of my ministry as a student pastor during college, I got a phone call in the middle of the night asking me to come to the home of a woman who was threatening to kill herself. I was a 19-year-old kid. What did I know about how to talk to a person like that? What if she decided to shoot me instead? I'll tell you what. I was one nervous kid on my way to that home, and somehow, by the grace of God, we both survived that evening. The week before I moved to California to take this job, I was called into the police station to talk to five families of children at a house party who had found a gun and accidentally killed one of the children. What a mess. What a, what a tragedy. Anybody can be affected by gun violence. If you have a gun in the house, by the way, statistically, it is more likely to be you or someone you love to be injured rather than an intruder. In certain circumstances, gun violence disproportionately impacts communities of color, women, and other marginalized groups in our society. Sometimes the mere presence of firearms can make people feel threatened or fearful for their lives with severe and long-term psychological effects on individuals and whole communities. When people are afraid uh, of gun violence, it can also have a negative impact on people's rights to education or health care when they're too afraid to attend schools or health facilities, or if these services are not fully functioning due to firearm violence in their community. What I want to say this morning is that the church must stand up. We must campaign for effective gun violence prevention laws and interventions to stop this madness of gun violence. Easy access to firearms, whether legal or illegal, is one of the main drivers of gun violence. We must insist in our communities that gun owners keep their weapons off-site of their home in regulated shooting galleries, always checked in and out. Ammunition, in my opinion, should be dispensed by prescription and not available over the counter. We must speak truth to power when the state has an obligation to protect human rights, creating the safest community environment possible for people, especially those considered to be at greatest risk. If a government does not exercise adequate control over the possession and use of firearms in the face of persistent gun violence, it is a breach of their obligations under international human rights law. But listen, the church cannot wait on the governments of the world to create the conditions of justice and healing and peace in our world. You heard it in the children's story. It's exactly right. Where is the community that offers this idea of peace and justice, God's way? right here. And we must say it. We must initiate reconciliation, starting right where we are. 
The Buddha said, hatred does not cease through hatred. Hatred ceases through love. This is a truth, he said, that does not change. The prophet Muhammad said, the one who forgives and seeks reconciliation shall be rewarded by God. The Christian scripture says, you heard it, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, do not become do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My friends, let us reaffirm our historic commitment to God's dream of shalom, peace with justice to a broken world. We need that. We need that. We need a people who will say that. This year has once again been a time of worldwide violence and hateful rhetoric. The conflict of ideologies around the world has been played out in places again, like Brazil, the United States, Venezuela, Mexico, India, Colombia. So far this year, there have been mass shootings in Texas, California, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Illinois, and Louisiana. The continuing targeting of young black people has resulted in cries for justice in the streets of all of the major cities in America. And every shooting is yet another reminder of the great harm caused by unaddressed racial injustices and divisions in America. And, the, and it is the reason why black lives still matter. America is a gun-wielding, gun-promoting, gun-obsessed culture. Not even the unrelenting cascade of mass killings by guns in the wrong hands has been enough to convince some state and the majority of national legislators that sensible gun reform is a key ingredient for a better public safety, and as a result, it's easier to get a semi-automatic weapon than it is to get mental health treatment. Jesus said those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. And the prol proliferation of that which we deem our defense is fueling our demise. Ultimately, those guns are loaded by our common enemies of fear and hate. The same ammunition is responsible for the bombing of mosques and the burning of churches and LGBTQ discrimination. The same ammunition of hate and fear fuels the escalating levels of death on our nation's streets. Irrational fear and hatred that nurse at the breast of a nation increasingly divided against itself. Our minds struggle to find a way to reduce this vast tragedy to a human level, a way to fathom all this pain and struggle in the world in a meaningful way. But we know this. We here know this. Our faith teaches us that people are more important than things. Our faith teaches us that life is sacred our faith teaches us that intolerance and racism is wrong. Our faith teaches us to love our enemies no matter what. And we here believe that at the heart of all religions is love. We must find a way back to love. Love is our only hope. Let's begin there. We're so glad that you listened to the message today. If you're looking for an open and affirming, peace-loving, and justice-seeking congregation, consider visiting us for in-person worship on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. We'd love to meet you.